Hello, my name is Jean Hartford Todd, and I am a certified child life specialist at the Duke Cancer Center in Durham. In my work as a child life specialist, I provide support and information to adults who are being treated for cancer around the needs of children and teenagers in the family. Today, I will spend some time talking about how to share the news of a cancer diagnosis with children and teens and how to support children and teens throughout the cancer experience. So the first question we might ask is why do we need to talk to children and teens about cancer? Rudolf Dreikers, an Austrian psychiatrist, noted that children are keen observers but poor interpreters. They notice everything, they hear everything, but they don't always understand what they're hearing and what they're seeing. And this leads to confusion and additional worries and fears. So one reason to talk to children and teens is to actually help them understand what it is they are seeing and hearing. Children often make up their own reasons for events if they are not told the truth. So if a parent suddenly starts walking into another room and closing the door when they get a phone call, children will notice that and will begin to wonder and even worry about what's going on. Often their made up reasons are more confusing or more frightening than the reality. And you might say, well, what could be more wor worrisome to them than finding out that I have cancer? But children will make up uh, reasons for the cancer. For example, they sometimes think the cancer is their fault. And so by giving them honest information that's appropriate to their ages, um, we can help dispel some of these worries. One thing we also want to do is to reduce confusion and fears about more common illnesses. So if a child sees a parent being treated for cancer and there's hair loss, or extraordinary fatigue, they might worry that they will experience those things if they have strep throat or an ear infection or a stomach virus. I also like to help prepare families for what I call the grocery store encounter. This is when a parent and children are in a public place and suddenly a well-meaning friend barrels up to the family and says, oh my goodness, I heard you had cancer. My uncle had the same kind of cancer, and then they start to tell the story. And the kids are standing there hearing it all. And what I want is for you as a parent or a grandparent or an aunt or uncle, is I want you to be in control of who tells your children about the cancer, where do they hear this news, when do they hear this news, and how do they hear this news. By sharing information about the cancer with children, you actually gain control of those things um, rather than leaving it up to chance. And one of the most important reasons to talk to children and teens about cancer is to help them maintain trust in the parents and other adult family members. If you want to be the person your children or teens feel good about, uh, going to you to ask questions or con concerns about any topic, you can facilitate that trust, you can build that trust by being honest with them about, about a cancer diagnosis. But that's easier said than done for many people. So what is it that stops us from talking to children or teens about a cancer diagnosis? A lot of parents worry that they will cry with their children and they worry that those tears might be frightening or upsetting to their children. They worry that kids won't understand any information about cancer. They worry that their kids are too young to have these worries. Conversely, I often hear parents say, you know, they don't even seem to notice. They're just in their own world playing and having fun. Many parents of teens worry about impacting their child's grades at school, especially the older high school grades where college potentially is in the near future. And, uh, you know, parents don't want their child or teen to struggle academically at an important time in life uh, for grades. 
some parents are inclined to tell their children about the cancer diagnosis and treatment, but then a friend or family member says, well, you're not going to tell them it's cancer, are you? And suddenly you're second guessing yourself, gosh, maybe I shouldn't tell them. So as someone who works with families uh, on a regular basis, this is what I've done for 34 years, I do support your inclination to be honest with your children about your cancer illness. Another situation that arises is, uh, and I call it protection of the child versus protection of self. But we know that when we tell children information, we are honestly at their mercy uh, with that information. They can bring it up anytime they want to. They can ask any question they want to. Um, and as an adult struggling with a difficult situation, we often want to be in control of that information. We want to think about cancer when we want to think about cancer, and we want to go to those emotional places when we feel ready. And by telling children about a cancer illness, we give up some of that control. And so I understand that challenge. Um, I, and it's, it's a very understandable challenge, but I just encourage you to be thoughtful and try to figure out, am I really trying to protect my child or am I needing to protect myself? And that can help you, you know, recognizing which of those is going on can help you work through that challenge um, and get to a point where you can talk to your children. There's also something I see very routinely called protection of the youngest. And this is a true story. I went to work one day and, and met with a family with a parent had a new cancer diagnosis. And the children in that family were about two and four. And the parents said, well, we've told the four-year-old everything. He knows I have cancer. He knows I'm going to get medicine. He knows that I told them that my hair would fall out, but we haven't told the two-year-old. Um, she's just too young to really understand. And then a short while later, that same day, I went to another room and I met with a family and their kids were, you know, about 10 and seven. And I heard the same thing. Well, we've told our 10-year-old everything. You know, she knows I have cancer. She knows I'll get treatment. She knows I'll be tired, but we haven't told the seven-year-old because she's just young and, and we don't think, you know, she's old enough to hear this. And then this, this really is a true story. I went to another room and those kids were about, you know, I'm guessing here, this was many years ago, but I'll say about 12 and 15, um, certainly into the, the teen years. And it was the same thing. We've told the 15 year old everything. We haven't told the 12 year old. He's not old enough to understand. So as you're thinking about your children, if you have more than one, and you're thinking about what to tell and how to tell and who to tell, be aware of that mechanism that seems to be at play in, in many parents where we don't give the youngest child the information they need to make sense of the information or to make sense of the experience. Um, and think about ways that you can share information to help them make sense of their world. Another very understandable challenge is that, you know, in our society, even with all of the advanced treatments we have, when we think about cancer, we think about the possibility of death. And we just feel as though if I tell my children or teens that I have cancer, all we're going to talk about is the possibility of death, or I don't even want to talk about that at all. And so what I'd like to share is that while we can't completely remove the question of death or the concern about death from this conversation, there are many important discussions that we can have with children and teens about cancer that don't involve death. And as we go through these slides, um, I'll cover some of that and uh, also, my services are available to patients of the Cancer Center, and you know you can reach out to me and, and contact me, and we can have a conversation about this very specific to your family, your cancer, and the needs of your children. Um, I also hear often that a parent does not understand the illness well enough themselves to explain it to their children. And for many, many folks, you know, 
it could be several years, 10 or 15 or 20 years since you've had high school biology, if you chose to take that at all. And, you know, some of that detail is lost over the years. Cancer's a word we're very familiar with, but um, even adults don't always understand what's happening to the cells in a way that helps them explain it to their children. And then quite simply, um, parents sometimes just can't find the words to explain cancer and treatments, uh, side effects to their children. So this is just to give you a, a sample of how you can explain cancer to very young children. To say something as simple as, I have a spot of sickness in my body that doesn't belong there. We can't see the spot with our eyes, but the doctors could see it when they did some special x-rays and did some tests. The spot of sickness is called cancer. If you hear us saying cancer, you will know that we are talking about that spot of sickness. And then I'll talk more later about treatments and side effects, but you can share additional information. For older children and teens, you can actually share information about cells and cell division and how cells divide in patterns and how those patterns change when there's a cancer diagnosis. And this again is something if you reach out to me that I can share information specific to your cancer and to your children's ages and to their needs. One concern parents have is, you know, how might my child respond when I tell them this news? And there's a wide range of responses that can be considered typical when children or teens learn of a parent's cancer diagnosis. Uh, some kids honestly seem to have no reaction at all. They just become very silent. They don't really say anything. They don't show any emotion. And parents are left wondering, you know, what are they thinking? If this happens with your child, I would encourage you to give them just a bit of information to help them know what to expect in the coming days. And then say, you know, we can take a break from talking about this right now, but I'm going to check back in with you later today, or I'm going to check back in with you tomorrow, and we'll talk some more. What this will do is give them a bit of time to process the information in small amounts. You don't want too much time to pass um, between this first conversation and the next, but a few hours to a day um, can be very appropriate to give some kids time to think about what they've heard and to think about what they might want to ask. Some kids will say, I already knew that. And if, if your child says that, explore with them how they heard about the cancer diagnosis. And then, uh, and please don't reprimand them if they were listening in. Um, kids listen in when they are worried or when they feel like there's really big news and that they need to feel safe by finding out what that news is. Um, but if they did overhear something either by chance or purposefully, what we want to do is to try to figure out how did they understand that information? And if they've misunderstood something, to clarify and tell them what's actually true. And then to go ahead and explain what you know so far about treatments that you will have. Some kids will just jump in with many, many scientific and medical questions. Um, knowledge is power, and so they want to know more. If you know the answers to their questions, just go ahead and, and share the answers and let them ask. If you don't know any of the answers or some of the answers, write down their questions, sort of empower your child or teen with the ability to get information, write down their questions, and then let them know that the next time you talk to your doctor or the next time you message your, your doctor or the medical team, that you will ask their questions and, and get answers for them. And then every parent's concern is that their child or teen will become very upset, crying or even sobbing, and that they will quickly understand that this is a serious illness and that the adults in the family are distressed um, and they will cry. And please don't think if your child responds in this way that you shouldn't have told them. This is a normal, healthy human reaction to hearing difficult news. And you can just give them a hug. If they're small enough, pull them into your lap and hold them. 
and acknowledge that this is hard news for everyone in your family. And also share what the doctors are doing to treat your cancer and talk to them about your family support community. Who do you have for extended family, friends, people at school or church who will support your family through this experience? And let your child know it is okay to have a lot of feelings about cancer. And if you yourself cry during this conversation, that is absolutely fine. I cannot tell you that your children or teens will like that. I don't know any, anyone, even adults, who really likes to see their parent cry. Um, but what you will model for them is that it is okay for our family to share feelings with each other and to support each other. And if by chance you become very distressed to the point where perhaps you can't even talk, then you just go back to them later when you're feeling in a little bit more control when you can and let them know that you did have really big feelings, but you are okay. And that even when people cry hard, um, it doesn't mean that they still can't parent, that you can, you know, you can let them know you can still take care of them um, and that you were just, you know, distressed in that moment. So what types of information should you share with your children and teens? You do want to let them know what you will have for treatments and that detail should include the names of the treatments. It doesn't have to be the official names for each individual type of chemo or chemotherapy if you don't, don't want to tell them that detail. Simply say that I'll have a treatment called chemotherapy um, and you can let them know whether it's going to be an IV medicine that you will have to go to the hospital to get or is it a pill that you'll swallow and you can take at home. Well, and that will help them know how is this going to impact their lives. Um, let them know how long your treatments are expected to last. For the most part, kids understand medicines as something you take for seven to 10 days and then you're done. You know, strep throat, ear infections, those types of illnesses, you know, a cold or a flu, kids typically get over within a week or two. And so sharing up front that you know it will be difficult, but it is normal for cancer for people to get treatments for months or even a year or more. Um, and this will help your children pre prepare for that and not be caught off guard when the treatments do go on. Think about how your cancer treatments and side effects might impact your children's daily lives. So if you expect to have significant fatigue as a side effect, you can let the kids know ahead of time that that's expected with the medicine you're taking. You might take some extra naps or you might have a harder time doing some activities. And again, let them know this is normal for cancer medicines because sometimes kids actually think that a parent is, is dying, is getting very sick when the adults are all sitting around and saying, oh wow, well they really did tell me this medicine would make me feel so tired. As you think about the side effects and what your kids will observe or hear about, talk to them about how all of this will impact their lives. Will somebody else drive them to school in the morning? Um, will somebody else take them to soccer or dance? And just help them understand how the cancer illness will impact their lives. Also talk to them about who will take care of them when you are at appointments or not feeling well. So they have a sense of, again, what that support will be and that they will always be cared for. So there, kids can ask any, any questions. Um, and sometimes I'm, even after 34 years, surprised by questions that children ask. Um, but some common questions that kids ask are, how did you get the cancer? And, you know, sometimes the answer to that is, we, we don't know. And that's one of those times when it's, it's okay to say, I don't know, and the doctors don't know. Um, and so, you know, what's behind that is, you know, the kids are trying to make sense of why is this happening, as adults do too. Um, but kids sometimes take it in a little different um, direction than adults do. 
and they think that somehow the cancer illness is their fault. So it's good to say something along the lines of nothing a person thinks can cause cancer. One person cannot make cancer start growing in someone else's body. This cancer is nobody's fault. It's not my fault. It's not dad's fault. It's not grandma's fault or your fault. No one can make a cancer start growing. And if you did engage in a behavior that does put you in a high risk group for, for cancer, you know, that's another conversation that we could have personally to help you know how to navigate um, that conversation with your children because there are ways to have that conversation. And I would be happy to help you with that. Kids sometimes wonder if cancer is contagious. Can one person catch it from another? Or can it just somehow move from one person's body to another? And so reassuring them that cancer is not contagious, it's not a germ, and it cannot move from one body to another is an important thing to share. And then the question that is very difficult to think about and to think about answering, and that is when your children wonder if you are going to die from the cancer. And no matter what type of cancer you have, and no matter how risk your cancer is, even if you have a very low risk cancer, your children are going to hear at school or on the news that some people do die from cancer. So to flat out say, no, that's not possible, I'm not going to die from cancer, can actually create some anxiety in them because what you're saying and what they're hearing, um, you know, they're not the same answer. So to answer something along the lines of cancer can be a serious illness and some people do die from cancer, but many other people live years and years and even a whole lifetime when they have had cancer. And to just say, I am not dying now, I'm taking my medicines and working hard with my doctors to try to make the cancer go away. Or you can say, to keep the cancer from growing some more. And, and explain to them that you will go for your checkups, your doctor will always tell you how you're doing, and that you will always tell your children how your checkups are going. And that if they are ever worried, they can ask you questions and you will tell them the truth. So this lets them hear that yes, some people do die from cancer, but it also lets them hear many people don't die from cancer. And again, if you have a high risk cancer, this is a conversation I'm happy to have with you one-on-one. -on -one. And again, there are ways to answer this question honestly, um, but being sensitive to the needs of children and the timing of when they might need to hear more difficult news. So what helps kids in general with the illness experience when a parent or grandparent or other loved one has cancer? Well, the first is what we've been talking about all along, which is to give your children information to help them make sense of their world help them understand what they will be seeing and hearing, and prepare them in advance for any changes that will occur, including changes in your appearance or how you will feel, including side effects from treatments. Some children are, again, what I mentioned earlier, information seekers. The more information they, they have, the calmer they feel. Other children are just the opposite. The more details they hear, the more anxious they get. All children need a base of information to help them understand what will be happening in your family's life. But beyond that, when you think about how many details to share, how much to share, you can think about your children's specific personalities and what helps them cope best. And again, that's a conversation I can help you with if you're not sure. Um, you can educate me about your kids and their personalities and I can share ideas and you can see if you think those ideas would be a good fit for your child or children. I do encourage you to inform your child's school so the staff there 
can support your child and contact you if they notice any academic or behavioral changes. Now this can look very different for little kids and teens. You know, young children, um, not 100%, but for the most part, the younger kids think it's wonderful if they get pulled out of class and get to go spend time with the school counselor and play a game and talk. Teens, not so much. The, you know, it's, they're just mortified if they get pulled out of class or if an adult at school approaches them and asks about a parent's illness. So again, think about your child's age and think about your child's personality and develop a support plan at the school that meets each individual child's needs. There's not a one size fits all plan um, in the school setting for kids and teens. This next uh, bullet can be challenging, but we do need to allow children to experience and express difficult feelings. Feelings of sadness, anger, and fear. And I think in our society, we often shut these feelings down and try to focus more on the happiness and joy and um, silliness and those feelings. Um, but it is important for all of us, not just children, but including children, to be able to ex express sadness, anger, and fear, and those other feelings that we might consider negative. If your child's behavior is inappropriate, you can redirect the behavior. So you can say something like, I can see you're having really big feelings right now, but it is not okay to kick your sister. I am going to help you stop kicking. If you need to kick, you can kick the ball that's out on the front lawn, but you cannot kick a person that's not safe. But it is really okay to feel angry and sad. And so you redirect the inappropriate behavior, give them a behavior they can engage in, and give them permission to have these feelings. If possible, allow your children to be physically active each day whether that's going out and playing in the yard or participating in a, you know, an extracurricular school activity, giving them opportunities to run and jump and pound really can help them blow off some of this stress and energy um, in a way that can be very helpful to them. And then as you share any difficult information with your children or teens, Think about, so I think it in the context of what will be different and what will be the same. So for example, let's say you're going to go to the hospital to have surgery and your child is distressed about that. So the difficult change you might say is, I'll be leaving Thursday to go to the hospital and I'll have my surgery on Friday and I will probably stay there about a week. Um, we don't know the exact number of days, but it should be about a week. And then as you share that difficult news, think about what will stay the same for your child or what will help shore them up. So what might stay the same is that they can still go to a friend's birthday party on the weekend. Uh, if they're going to stay at your house, you can say grandma and grandpa will come here to take care of you. So you will get to stay at home. You can go to school. You can go to Ashley's birthday party on Saturday. Um, and um, your friend Ashley's mom said if you need anything, she can come help you. So you again help them look to their community for support. One important distinction though is we don't want to share the stability information in a manner that we somehow give them the message that they shouldn't have the difficult feelings. It shouldn't be, oh, you don't need to worry because grandma and grandpa will be here. It should be more along the lines of, if you're worried, you can go see grandma and grandpa and they can give you a hug. So it's not that we want to tell them they don't have the feelings, we want to teach them how to cope with the feelings. A lot of parents ask me, how will I know if my children need help? How will I know if I should take them to a therapist? And my first answer is, I think any child, teen or adult can benefit from being supported by a licensed therapist when a cancer diagnosis is made, even if things are going well. However, 
if you notice that your child is experiencing any changes in mood or behavior that are so intense, so frequent, or so long lasting that they are unable to sleep, to have fun, to have friendships, to participate in activities, to eat, then it would be important to find a local therapist to meet with your child and to put that support in place. If they do not show these significant changes, but you sense that they need support, then trust your intuition and schedule an appointment for your child with a therapist. So I hope this information has been helpful. The last slide um, does share contact information for some of the support services that are available uh, at the Cancer Center at Duke. Um, I am the Child Life Specialist in Durham, North Carolina. Hannah Sasser is the Child Life Specialist in Wake County at the Duke Cancer Center Clinic. And then we also have our Medical Family Therapy Counseling Services at both of those locations. And all of these services are available at no charge. So no charge and no copay. So you can reach out to us individually. Again, as I mentioned earlier, for that personalized support that's specific to your cancer experience, your children's personalities and ages, and what your family needs are. So thank you very much for listening, and I hope you will reach out to us if you'd like to get support.